And it's welcome back to episode 16 or series three, episode six, I think, of the Deep Analysis podcast, We Love Ugly Data. I'm here, fresh from the gym and from returning his laptop back to Eastern Time is Alan. Yep. yep. Not the first time I've, I've done that. No, no, we've, 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 you've all been there. And funny enough, uh, you know, we've, we're recording this towards the end of June again to fit in with travels around conferences. We will come back to conferences at the end of or the, the third topic. That's a call forward to topic three today. Um, gives me opportunity as way of talking, you know, three topics, topic three. Well, as we know, part of the format is discussing the format. And there's a format. Format is three topics, 30 minutes, roughly 10 minutes a topic. We will try to keep the time. But, you know, if we get really excited, why do we pick the topics? Why are there things which are top of mind for us that we've, we've been writing about, we've been talking about, have occurred to us when we've been on the road, which is more Alan thing than me thing these days. Um, but um, really just topics du jour um, as we're uh, going through. And I'll try not to drop any more bon mots in French in there as well. So topic one, um, we've done some various bits of writing about it, but 2024, 2023 was the year where generative AI became generative AI assistants, where everybody wanted to have an assistant on their desktop to assist you with desktop things and be very assistative. 2024 is the year where AI assistants have become AI agents. Um, so having said I've not been on the road very much, I actually was with Salesforce a couple of weeks ago, not singling them out. I just happened to be on, on the road and I wrote something a little bit about um, well, they are, and they're almost kind of almost prototypical for those companies that invest a lot, certainly in, in, in product, but also in, in share of voice in, in 2023, talking about how generative AI was going to really transform the way in which people operated their applications. Um, last year was very much about, you know, the, the arrival of, for them of, of their first generation of co-pilots. Um, they weren't the first people to go co-pilot. Microsoft were the first co-pilots, and everybody calls them co-pilots, so it's just easier. We don't have to remember what the products are called. They're all called co-pilots. But last year was very much co-pilots as assistants. Um, and one of the things that um, that I noted from the um, uh, from the keynote at, at the the London leg of the of the Salesforce World Tour, which is kind of like a an event that happens in different parts of the world every month of the year, culminating with, with obviously with Dreamforce in, in September, I think it is this year. Uh, but this was a London event, so it was only a, a couple of a couple of uh, hours away from me, and was very much plotting that kind of um, um, a sort of progress process really from co-pilots assistants to co-pilots as agents. Now I know Alan, you've been seeing this on your travels, and I know that, that in Dan's IDP world, and here's another call forward to next month. Dan's on next month to talk about some IDP specific stuff, um, so we'll, we'll probably get onto a little bit of how this affects IDP specifically then with Dan because he's like. He's the expert, basically. Um, but from, from your travels, how are you seeing this in, in the first case? How are you seeing this manifest itself in the, the events and, and the applications that you're, um, that you're seeing, Alan? Yeah, so I was in Texas last week with um, Automation Anywhere at their customer event. It was an excellent uh -huh. event, actually. But yeah, I mean, they're talking about agents. Everybody's talking about agents. And, and I think you've got to be real careful here. There, there is a reality, yes that uh, as opposed to assisting you basically they'll do the job for you right that's the fundamental difference between an assistant and an agent it's uh, you know. and it's not new uh, we i don't know if it was the first time but probably the best example was i always get their name wrong work fusion is that the one where they they do the avatars and uh, it's like hi my name's Jen and I'm your tax assistant blah 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 blah, blah. and so they so the idea has been around a while um, it just happens to be trendy now really um, so maybe let's, let's let's face on a little bit because I've just gone straight in and started talking about agents like everybody knows what they what they're talking about and I'm sure if you're the kind of person who listens to this you know as much as we do we're pretty close to it but let's assume. There's some new people here who want it when we want to base on difference between assistant and agent. An assistant is basically, hey assistant, can you draw me a square on the screen? Hey assistant, make me a meeting for two o'clock, right? So it's very much a single point uh, action. Yeah. The idea of an agent um, um, and, uh, is that we can start off multi-step processes where the agent will go away and perform a task or a number of tasks kind of based on a decision, if you're familiar with the decision tree, or if you've ever been a programmer and done kind of if then else statements, which is basically fundamentally all programming, really, please don't send me abusive email about that. You, you know that's true. Um, the agents are, are designed to give you um, 
multi-step kind of processes, which may or may not, and certainly in the, in the short term, will ask you subsequent questions. Hey, Matt, at two o'clock, what meeting room do you want? Or meeting room three is available. Is that the one you want? So it's, so it's, oh, so it's giving you you know, a set a step of interactions. That's kind of just to, just to interrupt you, Alan. That's kind of a, a very quick version of, 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 of agents versus assistants. Yeah, and, and again, the, 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 the idea is not new. It just happens to be in fashion again. I mean, what's arguably new is that they're more sophisticated now and can undertake more sophisticated tasks, right? But it's it's not it's not a new idea, but it's it's got legs now, frankly, right? So, you know, Salesforce um, is a very good example, Automation Anywhere is a very good example, we both are, where, you know, they will build agents to run specific activities, right, to, with, a, with a large degree of autonomy, essentially. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, the people who really kicked this off this year, I think, in terms of talking publicly about it and demonstrating was probably Google, who've invested quite a lot, not just in AI, I mean, and, and in many ways, they're kind of responsible, you know, they're... they're uh, the skunk works is kind of responsible for this 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 current generation of AI with transformers, but um, they've invested quite a lot specifically in call center. That's yes. been the area where one of the few industry verticals where they've really put a lot of effort in has been into call center. And they were looking earlier this year for a call center agents, which you think would be a, you know a, a, a good candidate for this, and started talking about agents specifically. And since then, I don't think there's been a briefing that we've done, even for people who aren't doing agents yet are seeing that as a direction of travel. And I think this is, you know, we've, we've you know, we, we're, we're somewhere in the middle here. We're not like Jeffrey Hinton on one side who thinks AI is going to kill us all. On the other hand, we're not AI is going to transform the workplace next year. We're a little bit in the middle, a little bit like the Spinal Tap lukewarm water example, where we're kind of taking, you know, we, we understand the technology we understand the potential we also understand the mitigations and risk and we're sitting little in the middle saying well yes but yes but is probably our position yeah to describe yeah. It. Where, where things are where there is confusion here is that i think there's the assumption and certainly marketing suggests all of these ai agents which are coming uh, or already out there um are something to do with generative ai and that, that's uh -huh not the case right yeah. um, so if we take the call center example well it could well be generative ai that would actually make perfect sense wouldn't it and why would it make perfect sense well it doesn't have to be perfect that's why um it just has to be good ish right because the good good enough is good enough um whereas if you're doing uh if you're building an agent for uh compliance or, or tax related stuff that's a whole different thing. And, and there's a likelihood, I would say, that generative AI may, might play a role, but it might play a small role. Well, I guess in call center is a, a good example because most call centers have the notion, and I've always had the notion back from when I worked in call centers in the in the early 90s, um, have a notion of script and script handling and, and, and script call resolutions. So yeah. they already have a decision tree which is established and they know it works or doesn't work. They know the likely resolution points. They know the volumes and percentage that go to each node in that tree. So in a sense, the actual um, workflow or process is quite mature. Yeah. So actually plugging an agent into that um, to be able to handle that means you're at least you're, you're building on top of a process to, to call back to what we were talking about last month. You've got a process you understand, right? You're yeah. fundamentally in a, in a ready to go position. And that, that's where the concerns come because so that, that's why, yes, it makes perfect sense. That's a great use case. Um, when you start to get into back office activities that are not potentially documented at all, in some cases where you don't really understand the process, it's in John or Doris's head. Um, yeah. and th th that's where it all gets a bit, bit worrying at times, to be honest with you. But anyway, one way or the other, that is the popular thing to talk about this year, agents. Well, in, well indeed, and, and funny enough, be, before, you know, I, I'm, again, links to all the things which are on screen for people who are on screen, and if you're not on screen, there will be links to stuff that's that illustrative of what we're talking about in the show notes, which may or may not be below the box you're watching this in, but will be on our website and be attached via social media, blah, 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 blah. I, I wrote a little bit of thing about one of the issues with co-pilots is kind of 
perhaps some people are misunderstanding a little bit about the role that humans play in processes. And, and we, we need to be a bit careful when we apply these things to make sure we're applying them to the right area. We talked, I can't remember if it was the last time or the time before, a lot about RAG and about how RAG says that if you take all of your organizational knowledge and you dump it into a, into, into a vector or a graph database, which then attaches to your co-pilot, everything will be okay because it will be able to use all your organizational knowledge to answer the question. And what I say in, in, in this piece, amongst other things, and it's, it's, it's a bit of a ramble, but it's probably just about worth it if you're bored with a coffee in the morning, is that often the, the materials that we store are indicative of a decision. They're often not illustrative of how that decision was reached. Right? So the actual, the, yeah. the, 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 the emotional, philosophical, and um, processes that go to make up that decision are largely transparent for all documents, probably other than specific you know, court and procedural records where they have to be there because that's part of the decision-making process. For most of us, we've got a decision. We don't necessarily know how it was made. So we're, we're, we're missing out that part of the process um, when we're feeding our knowledge into, into these sort of uh, these systems. Alan, please. Yeah, no, that, and that, exactly. And actually, I, I talked about this with, with um, a few companies that, uh, who were attending Automation Anywhere last week. And it, it's, it's I, I wrote a piece for KM World just recently as well about tacit and implicit knowledge. And mm -hmm. it's the same sort of thing. It's like you said, oh, I've got a knowledge base. Well, yes, you do. But it's a record of what happened, not why it happened, not mm -hmm, how it exactly. Happened. And and if you talk to any good business analyst or any good process analyst or management consultant or whatever, nobody's going to disagree with this. But this goes back sometimes to the problem, the sort of the Silicon Valley mentality, right? That it, it all comes back to data. If I've got enough data, I can do anything, and it, it's not true. Yeah, if we and we and I, I've talked frequently in the past about our knowledge bases effectively being the exhaust fumes of our processes, um, and it's not that if you sit in a room with enough of them, eventually it will become overcome with it. I mean, you will, but that's not why. It's more that they, they are we, we're, we're storing them because we're generating them. We're not storing them because it's a way of showing our working, um, and showing your working is something that almost we have to be told to do when we're doing like exams and stuff when we're kids, because otherwise we won't. We'll just jump to a decision and go, there you go, there's, there's the answer. But, it, but it's even more than that. I mean, um, many, many, many years ago now, but when, when I was a business process analyst, right? I mean, honestly, if you ask somebody how they do something, they have to sit there and think, because mm -hmm. they do it. They don't really know how they do it, right? They've been doing it for 10 years or whatever. Well, it's, it's the example of the worst thing you can do when you're walking down the stairs and ask yourself, how am I walking down the stairs? Because that's the minute you'll fall. <laughs> that's the minute you're going to fall, yeah. So again, we're not we're not trying to, to diss all of this or whatever, but what we're Absolutely. asking is it's, it's, it's big business at the moment. Um, there's obviously AI is, is top of everybody's agenda. But when you really start to use this seriously in an enterprise, you are going to immediately encounter a, a lot of work that needs to be done before the value comes. Yes, yeah, because your knowledge base was not, let's not kid ourselves, that knowledge base wasn't created for this purpose. We've just was, happened upon the fact that it's suddenly become useful again. The fact mm -hmm. that we may not have lavished as much love over it as we should have done, and the fact that we didn't store it for this purpose, we're trying to forget those things, but actually they're really, really important when we start that auditory process that we should be getting into before we attach that to anything that's designed to learn from it. Yeah, and, and so, so certainly there's lots of money if you're a hardware vendor or microchip maker at the moment. That's great, that's wonderful. But I do think in, in terms of practicalities for our customers and, and um, the people who sort of follow us, uh, data activation as a service i think you came up with that but that is that is that's mm -hmm. that's going to be a very very big business because you're right you know we didn't accumulate all this data for this purpose but it doesn't mean it's all useless um and there is there is work to be done there and opportunities for people to dump it sift through it label it clean it make use of it and it's a big 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 job
Well, indeed, and funnily enough, you know, we've talked so far a, a little bit about um, agents and assistants and AI, and we haven't really talked about AI. What we've talked about is is kind of like step through processes, you know, repeatable tasks, and kind of now we're on to automation. I, we could scrub the word automation from this. So topic two, automation, um, zero spotlight and doing fine. We could scrub the word automation and put RPA in if you want. I don't put RPA because there are other ways of automating other than RPA, but broadly we're talking about, about, about RPA here. Um, Something that's probably had the had the spotlight moved away from it, um, yeah, totally because, yeah. because of the the, the, the volume of, 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 of words and pictures and uh, that's been talked about generative AI over the last couple of years. But actually, my, what I'm positing here is that spotlight is the shade in which is now lying in, give, allowing it to 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 pretty much do well um, and scoop up scoop up potentially a whole bunch of new use cases here. You were with Automation Anywhere last year, or last week rather. What, what's your feeling here? A hundred percent. I mean, I, I, I'm not going to be honest. I, you know, I've been covering RPA, well, since we started Deep Analysis, right? Yep. And, uh, you know, uh, there was a lot of horror stories, quite frankly. Um, and a lot of that's been ironed out. People sort of know where it works, where it doesn't work. They know how to use it properly now. And I had some, I mean, I talked to, I mean, I can remember specifically, I had talked to quite a few people, but the ones that really stuck with me was was a conversation I had with a big mining company, Latin American mining company and a, and a big bank here. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> you know, I mean, they're doing some really good stuff here. But the big, big thing for me was not only is this now part of their mainstream, right, in their business, this is, this is core to what they're doing mm. of, uh, it's that they've uh, in their eyes they've only just started yeah yeah um, yep. so yeah our rpa industry analyst firms have lost interest and that's that's life right um, well, up, on, up, on, up on the screen right now for those people watching it is a blog that alan wrote um last week about his impressions of being at automation anywhere which was in austin i think texas last week um again we'll be in the show notes um and funnily enough i ended up sitting and looking at going through UI past financial results yesterday. Um, I think they're they're um, projecting 1.3 billion this year. And I was looking basically at one of the things that we do around sizing and looking at what that means in terms of how much revenue is generated per employee. And we're, and, and the rough rough back back of a cigarette packet calculation for UI path was like about 350 thousand dollars per employee. Which trust us, that's good. That's right? very. Good. So yeah. there is money being generated. Automation Anywhere are a private company, so we you know we, we we don't necessarily know what their numbers are, but we we believe we, we believe they are doing well, right? Um, UiPath are, 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 are public, so we can see they're doing pretty well. So what's doing doing this? Well, if you think a little bit about what we were talking about last time and, and a little bit earlier on about things become easier when you understand the process, right? What some of the the weight of people's efforts in trying to understand the processes that they need to do as part of their AI prep, what is likely and perhaps already happening is they're shaking the tree and more use cases are falling out. And some of these actually are, these are relatively simple, repeatable. Oh, hang on a second. Yeah. Hang on, repeatable, simple. Well, they don't feel like they're AI things. Those feel like they're RPA things, right? And RPA vendors, they, with, except, with, with some exceptions here, you pay by the bot. The more process you add, the more money you pay. So it's a for them, it's 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 a it's a it's a kind of Christmas period, maybe. I think it's going to continue to grow. That's the whole thing because yeah. you know RPA alone uh, is very very useful, and tons and tons and tons of uh, uh, tasks have not been automated yet that could be automated. So there's no lack of opportunity there. Then you add in maybe IDP, um, yeah, you know, uh, to to that equation. And boom, you've got more opportunities. And yeah, I mean, they'll talk about AI a lot, and that's fine. That so they should. Um, but for a subset, you can add AI to things as well, right? And I, I mean, I think the RPA vendors are really in a good spot, frankly, because there is a measurable business value to a bot. And if you're a Gen AI player alone. That's very hard. So I, guess, really... I guess something else that comes along is is the fact that actually, um, the mean time from ideation to production is likely to be much shorter. 
much with, a, with an RPA bot. And I, I, I'm I'm saying that you know I, I, I you know, touch wood, but I, I'm pretty confident that that's the case from 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 my experience at least. Um, so the 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 payback proposition here is pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, um, but it also, you know, it's uh, it's for those organisations who perhaps have, you know, one of the one of the areas where RPA has struggled a little bit is in producing the right pipeline of appropriate processes, right? So once you get past those initial projects, where are the next things coming from? Now, of course, they need the next things to keep coming because, of course, as I said, they get paid by the number of bots which are commissioned, right? That's, so yeah, this is where things have changed because yeah. um, you know take financial services, whatever. Um, a lot of these banks now, they're not playing with RPA anymore. They have a center of excellence. They have yeah. a team that actually now really knows what they're doing yeah. and, and can pick the right things, right? Whereas in the early days, you know, it's the basic rule of thumb, right? Repeatable means the same way every time. Simple as mm -hmm. that, right? And they were picking things that were sort of repeatable and then wondering why it wasn't working. So there's been a journey. They know what they're doing now. Yeah, and, and of course, once you've had success, it gives you an understanding of what success looks like. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 these are good. These, I would. I mean, I'm serious. The next ten years should be good years for RPA. Yeah, and well, it's funny you should say that, Alan. And, and again, for those people watching, I brought up on screen a, um, a, a growth chart from our work intelligence report earlier this year, which shows the kind of um, the CAGR, the compound annual growth rate for the four sectors that we have within side work intelligence, one of which is task execution, which is very much RPA and things you can use for automating of simple tasks, so mainly RPA. Um, that's got a pretty healthy uh, CAGR between the 2024 and 2029 of about just under just under 14%. Um, whereas things like you know BPM are sort of um, much larger in terms of the revenue they're generating, but are bumping along at sort of uh, just over two. Um, and no code and low code is sort of just, just over 11. So, you know, um, the RPA stuff we think has got, you know, a good growth, solid growth potential. It's not growing at, you know, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50% a year, but it's far too mature a market to be doing that now, right? Yeah, it's, it's, you know, we're, we're talking about billion, billion dollar businesses here. So, um, you know, the ones that we, we, we you know, certainly around UiPath. So, you know, a, 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 a good uh, a kind of just around, just around the, um, uh, the RPA stuff, bearing in mind that many or most of them have broadened their approach to things beyond that. So on the right here, for those watching, we've got the mining intelligence stuff. Um, UiPath, as an example, are in that. AA, uh, automatic, uh, automation anywhere, are in that. So they, are, they have diversified themselves into larger areas, which are nicely allied to them. So that's just a way. That's just a long-winded way of saying yes, Alan. I concur. They are in for a good decade. I, th I think they really are. And, and uh, but it, it just goes back to it wasn't to sort of have a digger industry analyst like you know the Gartners, the Foresters, the IDCs, those being the three big ones, right? It's mm -hmm. the that that's the reality, right? It was it was hot and it was exciting and there was lots. And of they have to chase the ball. They have so to they, chase the ball. They have to chase the next thing. And so yeah, not much focus on it at the moment. The flip side of that is now. It's really taking hold in enterprises. And if you're watching or listening to this and you're thinking, yes, that's exactly what we're seeing um, in our work as a vendor or our work as a consultant, come and tell us about it. Come and buttonhole us at a conference, drop us an email, we'll get on a call. It'd be really interesting to, uh, to hear to either whether those validate our opinions, because that's always good because it makes us feel right, or if they tell us a story which completely conflicts, that's also really good. That's also how we learn. <laughs> so, absolutely. So far, being buttonholed at conferences and conferences in general, we thought we would do um, maybe the next two or three. We're very much in, in sort of like the first conference season of the year, or towards the end of the first conference season of the year. Um, I've done a few. Alan's done lots uh, this year, but over the years, we've done more conferences and got more lanyards than really anybody should everybody should own. Um, so we thought we would share just a little bit of our. Definitely do's and definitely don'ts. Or what was yours? Whether they're on the bench or whether they're starting? What was that? On the bench, off the bench. This on the start. bench, on the bench. I remember Sandra's idea. Yes. Okay. No. 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 Excuse me. It's fine. I, I just I should have written down what you decided to call it, but I didn't. So but yeah. I can't call it that. So, so 
the idea was, was to try and collate some of the things that um, that we see that, that are really good about conferences, that are, if they're in your program, to definitely stay in your program because they're very good. Also, things we see that make our teeth hurt and you shouldn't do. Now, important caveat, user conferences are not for me and they're not for Alan. They're not designed for us. We're often there because it's a good way for us to see what's going on. Very occasionally, there's little analyst programs that go with them, but they're not really for us. They are predominantly for people who use the software or people that are trying to make buy the software, right? So all of our do's and don'ts are couched on the basis of, of well, they're not really for us, but I like to think that we're trying to, part of what we do when we sit in the keynote is listen to what people are saying around us, listen to the reactions that are going on around us, eavesdrop on people when they're having coffee. So they are couched not just in what we think, but also what we witness when we're there. And I'm going to start, we'll do the do's first. Let's do it, start positive. We'll do the do's. They're quite similar. We did check what these were. So my, my first definitely do for this is definitely have customers on stage presenting their case studies themselves. Not you. You be quiet. In fact, you don't even be on the stage. And in fact, I would also say even let the customers present their slides in their look and feel and their font and then however they want to do it let them do it give them their 20 minutes and 25 minutes and then let them present it that authenticity and i know we we, we got a bit bored talking about authenticity particularly around, around social media a few years ago and we stopped using the a word now it's still really 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 important it's really important for the peers in the room to go oh we thought it was just us that struggled with that function that doesn't work, right? Other people found that doesn't work as well. People in the room who are coming to it, who maybe haven't started a project yet, are getting to see this is what a real project looks like. This is the, the real good and bad and ugly of it. And hey, you know what? It's really cool that this vendor lets them speak and tell them the things that didn't work as well as the things that did. And I think actually, funnily enough, that feeds into a little bit, which on your definitely do, which is uh, round tables. Yeah, it does. I mean, it, it, I think what 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 tech vendors need to to bear in mind is nobody's coming to your conference for the keynote. They they're coming there to network. That that's why they're there, right? That is the primary reason they they're going there to learn from one another, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember last year at uh, Open Text was a little session. I, I don't remember why I went to it to be honest with you but anyway I was sat in on this little session and it was mm -hmm. with this social services group to do with children who needed adoption or what anyway it was a super yep. simple case study but they presented it and it was it was just like whoa that was amazing I remember box um goes back before the pandemic box event is back this year actually um mm -hmm. but they they were very good at this too I can remember somebody like a city planner or something, you know, like an urban planner, uh, giving a presentation. And I, honestly, I was sat there thinking, I never even thought you could do that with Fox. Yep. That is, yep. and, and it wasn't just me. That's the point. It was people around us. Last week at Automation Anyway, anywhere, um, there's a, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it properly, Ballet or Bale, uh, they're the big mining company I mentioned, right? Uh -huh. yep. In Brazil. I mean, when he was talking about what he was doing, I was just honestly, I was sat there thinking, and anybody who would have heard that would have been inspired and would have wanted to network with them. That's yeah. That will sell more of your product, by the way, because it's a community. And round tables, if they're done well, are excellent. Um, yeah. I tell you what I don't like is uh, when it's breakfast and it's like HR people. I don't want to have breakfast with somebody and talk about <laughs> Um, but round tables, um, if they're done well, you people bond. Well, I think I said uh, when I said about presenting my case study, I don't want you then they're on stage. Maybe the perfect maybe the perfect setup is customer presents it, then they go into a uh, into a round table, which then can be compared by someone from the vendor to talk to two or three customers where they can ask questions. And I think again. That's that's a that's a good way of, of of bridging it. It allows you because ultimately it's your party and you're paying for it. So you are allowed to drive this a little bit, software vendors. It allows you then to drive that little bit towards you know the, what you want to be able to present and the threads you want to pull out of those stories. Um, you know, you, you mentioned one about 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 uh, children's services. 
I was at a conference last year that was one on children's hospitals. I, I suspect that probably they must give away licenses to anything to do with children's medicine. Because, oh, my God, you could, have, you could have heard a pin drop when they were talking about the outcomes they produce for, 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 for children's health for, for, for good, for, you know, for, for natural reasons. So but, now but you we, mentioned but people carry on. will listen to that and yeah. take it on board when your VP of development is stood there for one hour talking about how something works a little bit faster than it did last year. Nobody cares. Yeah. Well, you mentioned um, a, little, a little few moments ago. No one comes for the keynote. So let, let's just let's just dig it a little bit. We could probably do a whole session on, on, on what's wrong with keynotes, but let's just think about the specific ones we agreed in uh, in advance. I'll start again. One, don't try and be funny. No. Don't try and be funny, right? I have Ooh, seen oh. more attempts at oh, humour, oh. including on one occasion. I won't name the vendor. I won't name the elements because someone will pick it out where an international famous band was brought in to do a number on stage as a punchline for a joke, right? That wasn't very funny in the first case. The VP of sales might think they're very funny. The VP of sales staff might think they're very funny. Trust me, they're not funny. They're not funny. And worst of all, don't ever try to do skits. Save that for your sales kickoff, you know, for, your, for whatever you're doing internally. Never inflict what you think is funny on your customers or your boy, your peers, or, or, or your prospects, because trust me, it won't be humor. Stop it. it just yeah, it, it's uh, yeah. I can think of. I, I can remember. Well, again, I'm not going to name. I'm not going to do that. But I, I remember one particular year. I, I literally staked out. I couldn't sit through it. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I was just. I, it was just. I was cringing. Um, and don't do it. I tell you who gives one of the best keynotes, Larry Ellison. He's not funny. No, Larry uh, Ellison isn't funny. No, <laughs> well, but he gets up there and he tells you, and you think, "Wow, I've learned so much." I can't remember anything he said, but wow, that was a lot. I don't. Anyway, that's a serious keynote. Yeah, and I would say just just to finish on the humor thing, I've seen people who are funny, who are who are, who are funny people. They they're comedians. They're trained to be funny, right? Trained to be funny. They are funny. They're hired for the conference. They got on stage. Not funny. They're not funny in that environment. If they're not funny, you won't be funny. Don't try. Don't try. Anyway, you you don't like CEOs jogging on stage, Alan. It's, it's, well, I've got a couple. So first of all, just picking up on this, no two or two and a half hour keynotes. No. Oh, God. No. Not without an intermission. Not without an intermission and ice creams and a toilet break. Uh, and I'm going to tell every Alice relation person out there, you must know this. The only reason analysts turn up to the keynote is because we're obliged to, and B, that's where you make the announcements, right? So we've got a new product coming out. It's going to be so I'm there to note all of this down. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Two and a half hours. Got to be kidding me. But what really gets me is when you hear the loud music, the flashing lights, and the executive jogs out onto stage and <laughs> it's jog. And it's like, hey, everybody goes, oh no, no, no. See, that's when and that's when normally when they have their first go at humor. At that yeah. moment, they bounce onto stage in sneakers, brand new sneakers, and a suit. Again, sartorially, we're not doing today, probably shouldn't do it. Don't do that either. And then they try and make a joke. And then in this silence <laughs> do you know I, I i i'm not i shouldn't be giving tips or anything and I, hopefully i'm not but i, I when i speak I, sometimes I, I can be quite funny but it's it's that thing i'm not scripted right so if i get up there and i say something humorous at the beginning and i get no reaction i am saying anything any i'm serious from that moment on right you gauge your audience these big events are scripted there's no yep. way out yeah, yep. don't put it in there in the first place. Yeah, and if you have a, an event, or even if you're watching on a live stream and you don't think they're scripted, if you look around, you will see the auto cues on huge screens. Because I, I don't have an opinion about this, but one of the other things that happens in the keynote is the presenters walk around the room. Of course, once they walk around the room, they need multiple auto cues of various places around the room to keep on the script. So they're everywhere. They are very tightly controlled and very. You know, they always run over time for some reason, but they are very tightly scripted. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I just, I'll be honest. 
I t- absolutely loathe keynotes. I do go to them. I'm supposed to go to them. And just so anybody, just to tell you something else about an analyst, this analyst, analysts are very privileged. You already said that, right? We have a yep. night nice room yep. to go to, you know, so we're, we're all pampered and we're all given typically uh, front row VIP seats. We are, with, I, with, with, with power and, and sometimes a lamp. And I never sit in those seats, ever. I always do. One, I want to, I never do. One, I want to sit with actual people in the audience. And two, if this thing's going to go on for two and a half hours, how am I going to stand up in the front row and sneak out? So there oh. is that. There is that. I, 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 I used to do it, um, um, and I still do it to an extent, is that because you normally got somebody who, who, who gets you through security to get to your seat, and also at the end of it, sometimes you, you, you're shown a quicker way out. <laughs> which i know is super privileged and i realize that you're behind the velvet rope and we're bit and we're you know and you're very privileged and i am but yes. that's why i go and sit in those oh, seats no, I, 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 no i don't i'm, I'm absolutely refuse. on that bombshell on that's that the end of it today when i lit over a time we got a bit enthusiastic about for me particularly talking about don't ever do jokes if you ever hear me doing a joke then you'll you'll know i'm being uh I'm not, not practicing what I preach. Anyway, next time, three more to- topics, 30 minutes discussed. I mean, Dan should be in for IDP. Um, so get your, uh, I say get IDP questions in. We don't do questions on this. But if you're into IDP, definitely set a, a, you know, it's an appointment to listen. Um, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us again, Alan. Thank you. And thank you all for listening.